All right, take out your Bibles, please. Turn to James chapter 3. We're on the air, so pick it up. Turn to page 1883. Page 1883. James chapter 3. The, this lesson and the gospel lesson have a lot in common, fit very well together. And you're, we're going to read here how James, again, is writing to a variety of churches, mostly Jewish believers, around the Mediterranean world, and he's talking about the problems in the churches. And when you read this, you'll wonder how these people behave themselves, you know? So let's read this. You're going to hear words like selfish ambition, bitter envy, disorder, and evil practice. Sounds great, doesn't it? All right, page 1883, I'm going to start with verse 13. Let me read. You, we're going to read through chapter 4, verse 3. All right? Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts... Don't boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven. It's earthly, unspiritual, and of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition there, you will find disorder and every evil practice. Join me, please. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but don't get it. You kill, covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight you do not have because you do not ask God. And when you do ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get in your pleasures. This is the word of our Lord. Yes, motives are important in prayer. Turn to uh, Mark chapter 9, page 1569. Page 1569, Mark chapter 9. We're going to start with verse 30. So, uh, before we begin, let's talk about competition. How many of you consider yourselves competitive people? Let's see the hands. How many of you are competitive, but don't, are so competitive you don't want to admit it? Anybody else? We admit, you know, the early two services, there weren't many hands that went up. And knowing the folks like I know, uh, and I asked Debbie if I was competitive, and she said, absolutely. So, but anyway, competition isn't bad, is it? I mean, uh, a lot of good things happen in competition, right? We develop skills, we, uh, things get done, whether it's in work, new things are invented or accomplished. Think about uh, music, people, have any of you ever been in music competitions? You have? That's right, you would be, wouldn't you? That's right. Music competitions, how about reading, forensic reading? Anybody remember that? That's where you would read a poem Nobody had that in their high school? Did you have that in your high school? My wife did too. Very, I think it's long gone now. Well, what about sports? Anybody play sports? Com competitive in sports? Yes, and uh, that's good, right? But if you notice something in competition in sports, easily and quickly, whenever the Packers and the Vikings get together, their competition turns to it fights. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing to me. I don't care what sport it is. Now look at the tennis. Look at what happened in tennis this uh, a month ago. And you think of all these things, how competition can be a good thing, but quickly it can turn into something very bad, which is generally the way life is. Something good 
is you, turns into something bad. So let's read this, these uh, words of Jesus. And um, I'm going to read, start at verse 30, okay? So Jesus and the disciples left that place and they passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they didn't understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. Join me, please. They came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, so what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet, because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, If anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last, and the servant of all. He took a little child, had him stand among them. Taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. So keep your Bibles open. We're going to go through this. The first thing I want you to notice is the contrast between the top paragraph and the bottom two. Okay? Let's go to the top, verse 30. So notice they're walking. They're passing through Galilee, and Jesus pulls the disciples away from the crowds. Why does he do that? He does that quite often, by the way. He wants, to them, he wants them to focus and to focus on them, okay? What we have recorded here is probably a summation of all that he talked about, all right? So he says to them, the Son of Man is going to be handed over to evil men, killed, and on the third day, rise again. This, of course, was the defining moment of Jesus, correct? This was his passion, which was coming down the road as they went to Jerusalem, all right? This was a big deal. Look at the next verse. How did the disciples respond? Verse 32. They had no clue what it was about, and, and then they were afraid to ask. It really shows how thick-headed, let me use that German term, how thick-headed the disciples were. You know, it's amazing, and, and they really didn't get it until after the resurrection and even after Pentecost, and still they weren't sure. But they don't understand, and this was the second of three times recorded in the gospel where Jesus explains this to them, all right? So notice, that's the topic of discussion. Now let's move on to the bottom. So they come to Capernaum, and they're in a house. Whose house? Probably Peter's house. <clears throat> Maybe somebody else, but probably Peter. So Jesus says, so fellas, what were you arguing about on the road while we were walking? Now, you've got to understand that they probably didn't walk together as a group, all right? We, I think we think, well, they were all together so they could hear each other. Probably they were stretched out maybe 100 yards or so because they walked miles, okay? And maybe there were two of them here or three there. So they probably were not all together. So Jesus says, well, fellas, what were you arguing about? And they're silent. Why? Look at the next verse. They kept quiet because what? Oh, come on, folks. About who's the greatest. And they knew Jesus would not approve of what they were arguing about. But Jesus knows. He knows what they're arguing about. Okay? That's just like your mother and father. They always knew what you were up to. Right? Even though you thought, oh, they don't know anything, that's the great gift of moms and dads, right? They know what's going on, and you, you're totally oblivious. All right, let's go on. So Jesus sits down, he's ready to teach them a lesson. And he says, listen, fellas, if any one of you want to be first, be the greatest in the kingdom, you've got to be the last, and you've got to become the servant of all. Now, how do you think that was received? I don't think they got it at all. You know, I think they had that glazed look on their eyes, like, what does that mean? 
because in their minds, what are they thinking about the kingdom of God? They're thinking about a worldly kingdom where they, as disciples of Jesus, they will hold positions of power and prestige. That's what's on their minds. That's probably why they didn't understand about Jesus' death and resurrection. Because they're thinking an earthly kingdom that God's going to establish here in this world of power and prestige. Okay? So Jesus knows. And I'm sure they didn't get it. So what does he do? Look at the next verses. Now he pulls in a prop. Right? This little toddler, probably a two-year-old, or maybe younger, running around the house, he grabs that kid, puts him on his lap, and puts his arm around him, probably to keep him still. And he says, look at verse 37. This is what he says to the disciple. Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And not just me, but my Father in heaven who sent me. You catch it? All right? Catch the drama and catch the contrast. Here Jesus is talking about the defining moment of his sacrifice, and they're worried about who's going to be the greatest. Now, how did they have that conversation? You know, it's just crazy. It shows the separation between God's world and how God thinks and man's world and how we think. All right. So, I want to go back to the last verse, whoever welcomes me, and that's on our screen. I like the word receive. In another, other translations, whoever receives me. What is behind the word receiving? Behind that word is to take care of someone, okay? Has the idea of serving, caring for. The other word is helping. Whoever helps, whoever cares for one of these little ones is really caring for me, all right, and welcomes me. So here's the point. Ministry in the kingdom of God is the opposite of the world. Ministry in the kingdom of God is not about who's the greatest and positions of prestige. It's about taking care of, welcoming, and receiving the least in this world. And herein we have a great uh, object lesson. For all you who are parents, you will know this is how this is. When I uh, have pre-visits with couples before they get married, one of the things I ask them, well, are you going to have children? By the way, I have a wedding this weekend, and last week when I met with them, I asked them, are you going to have children? And they said, yeah, we'd like to have some children. I thought that was good. You know why? Because children teach us one of the great lessons of life. They teach us what it is to self-sacrifice and love and care for someone in need. And when we grow up as adults, it's usually all about us. And when that little baby starts to cry at 2 o'clock in the morning and you want to roll over and go back to sleep, you as a parent have to what? Get up and change that terrible diaper and give them a bottle, and especially with a colicky baby. Ever been there? You betcha. What does that teach us as adults? It teaches us that we have to put our wants, our needs last, and we put that child's needs first. And that is something you experience in the middle of the night when you, when you think to yourself, why did we ever have a child? <laughs> but that is God's way of teaching us. Now think about this. This is why we call our Father in Heaven, Father. As our Father who creates us through our parents, our Father in Heaven sends His Son into this world not to establish a worldly kingdom. He sends his son into this world to serve us. Jesus becomes last 
and servant of all. And we are moved into first place because he cares about us and gives up his life on the altar of the cross. Everybody get that? It's an amazing thing. God, when God comes into this world, he takes the last place. He becomes the servant. Who would have thought God would die on a cross? Jesus, in obedience to his Father's will, remember that. God so loved the world that he what? Gave his only son. We are elevated to first place. We're like those little children that our Lord Jesus now serves us. And we who believe and trust and follow him, now we are to become the same for others. Everybody got that? It's a wonderful gospel picture. And I'm going to tell you, folks, that's not easy. That's hard work. Because most of us are inclined to take care of ourselves and our own needs and what we want. So to serve and to care for others, whoever welcomes or receives. Well, here's the image I want to leave with you. When you and I engage people, whether it's a little child or an old man, or an old, or older woman, we are actually bringing to them the greatest gift of God. And that great gift is the love of God for them, our Heavenly Father. And I want to impress that upon you. You know, I think sometimes we're afraid to witness, we're afraid to engage, we're afraid to care for people and to love them and, and, and serve them because maybe we don't want to be pushy. But just think about this. When you, in the name of Jesus, engage and care for people, you are bringing to them the greatest gift from God, the gift of eternal life with their eternal heavenly Father. And I want to impress that upon you today. And maybe that takes time. You know, maybe it doesn't happen like this. But we, as followers of Jesus, we are to become the servants of others. And we are to care for them. Maybe that means we meet their physical needs or emotional needs or whatever that may be. But we also are the bearers of the great gift of our Heavenly Father for them in their life, whether they reject it or receive it. We are the bearers of the greatest gift of God. So when you have opportunity in the lives of others, remember that, that you're bringing in what, who you are as a follower of Jesus, not your good gift, but the Father's good gift. Take out those inserts, the prayer inserts. Would you do that for me, please? And here is what I, this is the category for these prayers. I want you to think of someone in your life who needs a prayer that Jesus may make himself known to that person in some way. That may be through you. It may be through a health issue. It may be through whatever. It may be a dream. It may be a vision. I have someone right now in my life whom I have known for a long time. And I am visiting that person. And as I, this week, it just hit me that I am there, I need to be there to serve that person and family. And part of that is to bring Jesus along with me. So I want you to write down Name, if you want to write a name or use initials of someone, for Jesus to make himself known in a greater way to that individual. Okay? You don't have to put your name on there. You can put other things on there, but specifically today, this category. Okay? So go ahead and do so. Give you time. 